You're listening to the Becoming Who You Are podcast, your guide to authentic living. Visit becomingwhoyouare.net for more resources, tools, and suggestions designed to help you create the life you want from the inside out. Now here's your host, Hannah. Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Becoming Who You Are, the guide to authentic living. My name is Hannah and I thought today I'd talk about some tools for authentic living. Before I do that, however, I just wanted to say that I apologize if you can hear any background noise. I'm currently in Merida in Mexico and it's carnival time. So everybody has taken the week off work and are currently partying around the clock, um, which doesn't make for very peaceful living. So I hope it's not too disturbing and you can still enjoy the podcast. So as I said, today I would like to talk about emotional tools for authentic living. Now, these tools are more emotional than practical, as I found out that having the practical tools was all well and good, but that things really started to fall into place for me when I started developing the emotional tools I'm going to talk about as well. If you're interested in practical tools, please take a look at the link in the show notes below to the Becoming Who You Are blog, where I've written a lot about this. Um, I'm also going to do a podcast about it in the near future, but check out www.becomingwhoyouare.net in the meantime for more tools, tips, and resources related to authentic living. So let's focus on emotional tools. Creating some of these tools, turning them from a conscious decision into an unconscious process, requires creating new neural pathways. And this takes time, a lot of time. But like everything new, we start on the first day, we take baby steps, and we do the best we can with what we have on any given day. The first tool is knowing the difference between the past and the present. This section is about emotional triggers. Emotional triggers are feelings we have in the present that are influenced by events in the past. When we're emotionally triggered by a situation, person, or event, We relive the emotions we experienced in the past in similar situations. People who have symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder might be affected by emotional triggers. For example, if someone has been involved in a war, the sound of a door slamming might be alarming to them or even provoke an anxiety attack because it reminds them of the sound of a gunshot or similar. Equally, we build a catalogue of triggers from childhood. Children are a lot more vulnerable to emotionally traumatic events, whether in the form of a nasty comment, of shouting, physical abuse, or so on. And this is because it's usually the people they depend on and need in order to survive who are the source of the trauma. Having a parent or other caregiver shout or call you names, hit you, or perpetrate any other kind of abuse really leaves its mark. When the people we need to survive acting in a rejecting way, we do everything we can to avoid them rejecting us again in the future. It is this desire to avoid them rejecting us that causes the wash of emotion or the dissociation that forms an emotional trigger. For example, if you are criticized for your weight as a child and someone refers to you as curvy or another phrase in adulthood, That could be totally well-meaning, but we might feel a wash of embarrassment, of shame, and humiliation. This is an emotional trigger. Emotional triggers can also be represented by dissociation. Sometimes feelings are so overwhelming and so painful that it's like an emotional fuse blowing in our minds, and consequently, we shut down emotionally. So how do we recognize when we're reacting to things that happened in the past rather than in the present? The first way is to notice when you feel a strong emotional reaction to something. Some strong emotional reactions in the present will be just, but a proportion of these reactions aren't really to do with current situations and are more to do with past hurts and disappointments. The next time you feel a strong emotional reaction come up and you suspect it might not be wholly based in the present, ask yourself, when was a time in the past that I felt like this? And try to find a pattern in the jigsaw pieces. The second tip I have for this is one I got from Yogi Tea. Yogi Tea is a brand of herbal tea in the UK and I think in the States as well. And they always include a thought-provoking quote on the tea bag tab. And one of my favorite of these that I've seen come up a few times now is act, don't react. That's act, don't react. Now this isn't going to stop feelings related to the past coming up in a present situation but it will help you stop and think before acting on them. Once you know why a feeling has come up, you can take steps to process it. 
The second emotional tool is knowing how you feel. I've talked a lot about gut feelings in previous podcasts and also on the blog, and I've talked about how they sometimes become disguised by other feelings, leaving us unsure and untrusting of our instincts. Our feelings might be influenced by the past. They may not be what we want at that particular moment, but feelings don't lie. They're there for a reason, and accepting them is one of the most difficult but rewarding things about personal development. Emotions can also manifest as physical feelings in certain parts of the body, so staying staying in touch with aches, pains, heaviness, and all the good stuff as well, like lightness, freedom of movement, and energy, can help you work out which feelings show up where. As an example, around this time last year, I had a massage, and at that time, I had been experiencing some lower back pain. I thought this was due to lifestyle changes because I had been living in London before that and then living in a different city but working in London and I'd been cycling and walking to work. The couple of months leading up to this after Christmas, I was quite sedentary because I was working from home. So I mentioned this to the woman giving me a massage and she felt my lower back and asked me, do you have any stress in your life right now, especially financial, because there's nothing wrong with your lower back. And I've always been slightly wary of this concept that we store um, we store emotions up in our bodies. It's always felt a little bit woo-woo to me, and I've never been sure if that's actually the case. But certainly at that time, I had just gone through a career change. I was also training to be a counsellor, and so finances were definitely on my mind. Um, I've also heard a similar theory through a man called Alexander Lowen, who is a psychologist who pioneered a movement called bioenergetics. And he's written a number of really great books, uh, my favorite of which is called Narcissism, and you can find that in the resources section on Becoming Who You Are. But he proposed that we store anger in our shoulders. And so there, there is definitely a movement out there which has a theory that we do store up emotions in different parts of our body. And I have definitely found myself that when I'm feeling particularly tense, I tend to hunch my shoulders, and that's where my emotional tension gets stored. So it's there, just waiting to come out. Now, keeping a journal can be useful for exploring these emotions, but I've also found it helpful to exercise regularly, so to do something that builds up a lot of heat in the body and encourages our muscles to stretch out and then relax, because if you have a lot of tension in your body, doing something to release it, like going for a run or doing yoga, um, when you stretch out those tense muscles, you release the energy, and that can also release the emotions that we've stored up without even realizing it. The third emotional tool is knowing when to take responsibility and knowing when to give responsibility back. The basics of this rule are A, take responsibility for your actions and feelings, and B, don't take responsibility for other people's actions and feelings. If someone feels upset because of something you did, think about where that action falls on your own moral compass rather than only listening to theirs. Own what is yours and give back what isn't. In practice, this is a very difficult balance to attain. It's very easy to say that, but in the moment when you're in an interaction with someone, it's really, really hard, and it's sometimes difficult to see where the responsibility lies, particularly if we're susceptible to things like people-pleasing, guilt, or so on. We can find other people quite convincing, and we might find them convincing when they try and hand us things that are really their responsibility. And equally, the flip side of that is that we can't expect other people to fix our hurts. So there's this um, anecdote that I really like from a psychologist called Nathaniel Brandon, and he talks about how one time he was running a group, and he brought this up in the group. He said, no one is coming to save you. And what he meant by that is, look, you, you have to take responsibility for meeting your own needs. Nobody's coming to save you. And... A member of the group piped up and said, well, you're here. And in response to that, Nathaniel Brennan said, yes, and I'm here to tell you that nobody is coming to save you. So the fourth and final tool is boundaries. Now, this topic is huge. It deserves a full episode on its own because it is so, so important. However, I wanted to mention it briefly as the last, but certainly not the least item on this list, as it's something that I found really helpful for my own personal development. 
I think part of the reason that boundaries can be so difficult is that there's an unspoken rule in our society that having strict boundaries is bad. You're wrong if you have strict boundaries. If you're interested in learning more about boundaries and how a lack of boundaries can severely impact our lives, I highly recommend a book called Boundaries, Where You End and I Begin by Anne Catherine. I read this book fairly recently, and one thing that struck me, particularly as a woman, is that I think asserting boundaries in our society can be considered quite rude and standoffish, when actually what we're doing is protecting our personal space. This book made me think of many situations in my own life when I found it really hard to assert my boundaries, and other people have violated them, sometimes in a pretty minor way, and sometimes in a very serious way. Uh, Just to give an example of a a minor incident, I've had situations before where people have hugged me, and I haven't felt 100% comfortable about it, usually because I don't really know the person very well. And for me, hugging is something that I do with close friends, and we don't really, you know, we might not really have the relationship basis for that kind of close contact. And in those situations, I've sort of gone along with it because a voice inside me pops up saying it would be really rude not to. But actually, if I was really listening to my own needs and what I wanted, I wouldn't do the hug. The other person might think it's rude, but if they get offended and react to it, perhaps that's a sign that they don't respect my boundaries. It's really difficult to summarize boundaries in one short segment, but I think what it boils down to is trust your instincts. Don't feel socially obligated to do anything or receive any kind of behavior or attention that you don't want, especially if other people say you should without taking into account how you feel. Protecting your personal space, whether this is physical, emotional, or both, is an act of self-care. It's not rude, it's healthy. And if people try to tell you otherwise, just remember that you have a right to protect yourself. It's kinder to yourself, and it's kinder to the other person too. So that's the four emotional tools for authentic living. Thank you so much for listening today, and I hope you found it helpful to hear about them. If you have any feedback, any questions about how what I've talked about might be relevant to your life or have any emotional tools of your own to add, please get in touch by emailing me at hannah, that's H-A-N-N-A-H, at becomingwhoyouare.net. I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Becoming Who You Are podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please head over to iTunes and leave a review. You can get in touch with Hannah by emailing H-A-N-N-A-H at becomingwhoyouare.net. Don't forget to visit becomingwhoyouare.net and find out how you can use rational personal development to live an authentic life.